Good evening, and welcome to another installment of Meet the Scientist. This has been a great way to introduce you to many of our scientists at the Coastal Studies Institute and across some of our partners, including East Carolina University and, and University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and several partners beyond that in the coming future. So I want to thank John McCord, Parker Kellum, and Blake Williams for working behind the scenes. You don't see them, but working behind the scenes, the cameras, to create such a great event for me and for you. And I also want to thank you. Your contributions to CSI, whether through last week's Pirate Nation Gives or simply on your own, make programming like this possible. And yes, I feel like an NPR announcer. But it is true. Thank you for your contributions to our programming and our scholarship funds. So I want to make everyone aware that we are intending to offer several summer camps starting in July. These, com these camps will follow a very strict COVID-related safety protocols, but will offer middle and high school students an opportunity to learn and enjoy coastal-focused programming here at CSI. So please inquire with our outreach and engagement team, Parker or John, and visit our website for additional information. So tonight, we're happy to offer, or happy to welcome Dr. Jim Morley to the hot seat. <laughs> Thanks for joining us, Jim. You're welcome, glad to be here. And so as a brief introduction, I'll also let Jim introduce himself through many questions. Um, Jim is a fisheries ecologist. He's got degrees in biology from SUNY Cortland, and I'm gonna ask where Cortland is, <laughs> fisheries and wildlife sciences and zoology from NC State. So Jim has worked as a research scientist at Rutgers University, at Chapel Hill, um, prior to accepting his current faculty position at ECU's Department of Biology and out here at the Coastal Studies Institute. So Jim works full-time here at CSI and leads the Fisheries Ecology Lab on our coastal campus here. So welcome, Jim. Thank you. All right, so as a start, so people get to know you. Um, so I mentioned biology, zoology, wildlife. So how did you get interested in ecology and fisheries and ultimately, I guess, and the, sort of the grounding in biology? Um, well, I guess my path here has been fairly random. Um, <laughs> Nothing's <laughs> random. Well, I mean, I, yeah. So I started out as an undergrad at, at SUNY Cortland, which is in yeah, Cortland, which is technically the the exact middle of New York State. There's okay. actually like a point in SUNY in Cortland that says this is the exact middle of New York State. So you know, irreg irregularly shaped state. But um, yeah, I was a history major. Um, and I took a biology course just as, a, as one of the required general education courses that everybody needs to take, uh -huh. and I loved it. Um, so I switched my major at that point. Huh. Um, so history to biology. Yep, so right. that's a common transition. That's, that's very common. <laughs> um, and yeah, I took a couple of really um, influential courses as an undergrad that involved traveling to different places. Um, one was at Shoals Marine Lab, so it's where you go and spend a month on an island uh, off the coast of Maine. And then another course, we, we went to Belize for a, a couple weeks. So those, I think, those really got me interested in marine science. And um, uh, well, after- Those were really, sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, oh, but those okay. are very experiential yes. type courses yes. that you took, right? Which is so, why it's, it's exciting to teach here. Right, I was I, say, so that connection yeah. here is really a lot, you yeah. know, in your own history. Yep, I feel like I can, I can give back the same yeah, influences awesome. that I had. Um, uh, graduating college, I was still sort of thinking I was gonna be a biology teacher. Um, I, it was at that point, I think I started realizing all the different types of careers one could have in the right. sciences that, I, that were sort of abstract to me prior to that. Um, and it became fairly clear that I needed to go to graduate school to get some of those, those jobs. So uh -huh. um, I went to NC State University, um, not having a really um, precise uh, interest beyond ecology and marine sciences. And I got hooked up with a great advisor, Jeff Buckle. And um, yeah, then I ended up in fisheries and the rest is history. So you did come back to history. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes. And yeah. so you spent some time at Rutgers and then some time um, in Moorhead City at Institute of Marine Science. And yep. so did that sort of frame your research and, and, and you want to sort of give an introduction to what your general research is? Yeah, that, that ha was hugely inf in, uh, influential on in my research. So at NC State, my grad work was very uh, much involved a lot of field work and some laboratory experiments. Um, and then I went to Rutgers and, and worked for them for three years. And that really um, 
got me much, I, I built my skills up in data analysis. So that, that three years I just spent crunching numbers and analyzing huge data sets and um, taking my uh, statistical skills to the next level. And that has been a, a skill that has really informed a lot of the work I do now. Um, but then I came back to Chapel Hill and started doing field work again and using some of the, the um, high tech tools that we'll probably talk about today. Right. Um, and that has also, is, is also something I'm carrying with me. And, and that's how this, you know, that's how this job is. You, you, you take these different jobs on your, your path up to, you know, wherever you might end up and you uh, learn some skills at each of those jobs and, you, and yeah. then you take them with you. More tools in your toolbox. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so your background provides a lot of good statistical analysis that allows you to say, consider things like climate and how that might influence things, which I'll bring up here in a little while, mm -hmm. but a lot of tools for actually getting out in the field. And so, I mean, that's, I think one thing that's interesting about fisheries ecology and the work that you're doing is it, it does involve certainly work in the lab, work behind the computer, but a lot of work out in the field as well. So it yep. is sort of all encompassing yep. when it comes to your research. Yep. So some of your research um, involves um, oyster aquaculture. And so I thought we should probably define what that is, mm -hmm. at least initially, and maybe what that looks like too, right? So people yeah. might not, or maybe they have seen <laughs> some oyster aquaculture out and around. And so maybe sort of define what that is and what it looks like. Okay. Um, well, I mean, there's, there's a very long history of oyster aquaculture in the world and in the United States. Um, the way it's been conducted has changed a bit over the years, and especially more recently. Um, but it really involves manipulating oysters in any way um, to enhance harvest. So traditionally, you know, we put, and we still do, put shell on the bottom and allow oysters to naturally recruit to those areas. Um, but increasingly, folks are growing oysters in different types of enclosure gear. So cages, trays, you know, mesh bags, things like that. And um, yeah, and and a little bit more of an intensive method to to grow oysters. And so, would would putting um, the shells out on the bottom to try and enhance recruitment would that be considered aquaculture, or is that just a way of trying to enhance recruitment? I mean, I, I think it can be considered aquaculture if you have a, a designated plot, Area. like okay. your plot, and you're and you're you're basically farming natural recruitment. Right. Um, but yeah, I, I, you know, it is a little bit different and you're not, you're not getting a, um, small oysters from a hatchery and then growing them yourself, which is kind of what's done more with the intensive aquaculture. And that's the method that has been growing um, really around the country, right. but and, and including in North Carolina. North Carolina is, is sort of a little bit behind the the game though I, yep. I think of to our north of virginia and what they've done in the way of oyster aquaculture over the last decade mm -hmm. or so and, and the amount of sort of the economic impact that it's had for that state and yep. i think north carolina's looking for ways of of increasing that impact within our own state is that fair yeah i mean and not just your know, virginia is a, a good example um, but really a lot of the northern states oyster aquaculture ah, okay. and clam aquaculture has really taken off and they've um, created different ways to incentivize um, people starting new leases. Um, North, yeah, and as you said, North Carolina has been kind of, the industry hasn't really grown much up until maybe 10 years ago. Um, and since then, there's been a, a big uptick in the number of folks that are growing oysters in floating structures. Okay. And if you spend any time on the water, you're probably seeing um, some of these um, oyster farms with the, with the floating enclosure gear, which is becoming more common. Okay. So they're a few different methods for this oyster aquaculture actually Correct. out in the, the yep. estuaries themselves, floating or on the bottom. And that's been the, the fun part of doing work on oyster aquaculture really is every farm you go to is just a little it's bit a different, little bit different. It's, it's, which is really kind of cool. Um, there's, you know, there's different types of floating gear, there's different types of bottom gear, um, and the oyster farmers are really kind, a lot of them are kind of like, uh, you know, like not, you know, geeks in a way that they're 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 tweaking different methods to right, grow oyster yeah, to try and get trying the, the latest the best crop, uh, right? Yeah, I mean, yep. it's just like harvesting something on land. You want yep. the best crop available. And so, again, North Carolina has been a little bit slow to to increase oyster aquaculture, particularly from either you know within cages, floating mm -hmm. or not. Um, what, what I'm trying to think how to best <laughs> phrase this. I mean, so some of this is is driven by. 
I mean, oysters are certainly have been prevalent in our waters for a long time. Um, that has declined, and so why wouldn't you want to increase this? Why wouldn't you want more oysters and, and, and developing methods that can increase oyster populations in our waters? I mean, there's not, in, in my opinion, there's more, um, uh, you know, uh, incentives to increase it. Um, the only, there, there are downsides as a culture potentially, and, and usually it's kind of like the, uh, if, you know, you're, you might be taking a pristine estuary and you're putting an oyster farm in it, so you might lose some of the aesthetic of, of an estuary. Um, but I think even that's debatable. I, I kind of like the look of a, a working waterfront sure. within, you know, within reason. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot, of, a lot of the other states have taken off faster than North Carolina is because they were just kind of earlier in... Um, just creating incentives to try to, you know, they they oh, took right. they took effort, to change the regulations, um, set aside areas that are sort of predetermined to allow oyster culture growth, um, and just have really tried to promote it. and And North Carolina is doing that now. Um, North Carolina has a bit of an advantage in that they can see how other states have done it, sure. and they're trying to strategize the best way to grow it. And right. um, it's a, it's, it's a surprisingly complicated, um, the regulations and, and how to grow an industry like that are, are, are more complicated than you might expect. There's a lot of stakeholders. Yes. Right? I, and, and so it's not just those that are growing, but those that, are, that use the waters, those that are interested in the bottom. Yep. Or in how this might impact the bottom, right? So I think that's kind of an interesting thing about oyster aquaculture. Regardless of whether you have floating or, or cages on the bottom, there is a potential change in the habitat where those, uh, I don't know, where, where that, those, that oyster farm, if you will, mm -hmm. is, right? And some of that is what you're studying, is the yep. potential change or impact to the habitat or the change in that habitat. Yep, that's, that's, that's like the key focus of a lot of our um, work over the past five years. So, I mean, you're, you have a, you know, a, an un altered estuary to start with, and you're literally transforming a parcel of that, you know, that landscape, the seascape, um, and turning it into an oyster farm. And yeah, we, we're trying to understand what the implications of that are for the, you know, the, the broader um, habitat function of estuaries. And so why is that important from this perspective, right? I mean, it seems like oysters are something that people want. We know that oysters um, filter water, so clearly they are helping, you know, in some sense cleanse the water. It seems like, you know, win-win, right? What, are there potential impacts and why do we need to study that? Um, I, I agree. I think it is a win-win. Um, I think a lot of times when uh, decision makers are, are trying to act on different legislature, leg legislature there's, there's often a lack of data. So mm -hmm. they you know, people bring up the fact that oysters are are hopefully returning a lot of the lost o ecosystem services from our once historic huge levels of oysters in the state. Right. Um, so, yeah, we're just trying to put data to that and show the the potential habitat benefits of of oyster culture in in the fact that fish abundance is higher off of them. Um, another aspect of our work has been um, looking at interactions between oyster aquaculture and seagrass. So. Seagrass is a hugely important type of habitat, and, and globally it's really endangered. I think, you know, there's like a, a football field lost every day right. or something We talk like about that. the blue yeah. economy and blue yeah. carbon and how yeah. seagrass, SAV, submerged aquatic vegetation, can store that mm -hmm. from a global carbon perspective and the right. importance of that. And SAV in our estuaries, like many estuaries around the world, has declined significantly as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think... I think North Carolina is sensitive to that and w not wanting to see any further decline in SAV. Yep, and that's so. So some of your work is also interested or, or, or looking at the the differences and the benefits versus impacts associated with SAV versus right. The so like the trade-offs between and potentially the the spatial uh, uh, closeness of of SAV and oyster farms. Um, it's, a, it's particularly a big issue on the Outer Banks because there's so much seagrass on the eastern areas of Pamlico Sound. Right, and the it's also, side of the island. Yeah, and it's also really good water potentially for growing oysters and could potentially really um, bolster the local economies. Um, it, it has been shown, like, it, uh, 
Oyster culture can negatively impact the seagrass right underneath the lease. And we found that with our work, that, that there is, with certain types of culture, there's potential negative effects within that footprint. Um, however, we visited um, multiple commercial leases where there was seagrass growing in the lease, and these were leases that have been operating for a long time. So there can be some level of coexistence. Um, and also, you know, it's really important to take into consideration that the, the oysters are cleaning the water and that might benefit the, you know, the landscape of seagrass. Yeah, in I mean, general. generally SAV is decreasing in our systems because of yeah. water clarity, poor water clarity, right? Right. At least that's one of the reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and so oysters, at least, you know, it's interesting to hear some of um, um, some of the old timers, if you will, and I apologize. <laughs> to <laughs> but how clear the waters in the Albemarle Pamlico system used to be, right? Mm -hmm. Again, used to be, and, 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 that, and a lot of that was thought of from the sheer abundance of oysters. And, you know, I, again, I've heard things about how, how often water was turned over or was, was filtered through, you know, it was, I don't know what, I can't remember what it was, but it was an incredible turnover rate of water of the Albemarle Pamlico. Yeah, and I've, I've heard similar uh, facts about like the Chesapeake Bay. I think right. you know the entire. I don't know if they're facts. The entire, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like the entire Chesapeake Bay was turned over or filtered through in a matter of you know several days. Days, yeah, uh, yeah. days um, through just the sheer abundance of these oysters, and so it, it sounds like you're studying the habitats. You're studying fish around these areas, looking mm -hmm. at SAV, maybe looking at water quality as well. Um, you know, as much as a, as a fish ecologist, sure, that makes water sense. quality. <laughs> yeah, and, and as not being a, an ecologist at all, I just refer to all of these things as critters anyway. Yeah, um, fair enough. And so what, what are some of the tools? You mentioned you've got a lot of tools in your toolbox, yeah. right? From statistics to um, some acoustics and other ways. What are some of the tools that you use to actually do some of this research? So we, we did a lot. We threw a lot of different um, <laughs> methods of, of uh, field work at this sort of thing. So... Um, we, we did some standard low-tech low um, fisheries approaches. Um, we've, we sampled about 20 commercial leases um, with traditional um, net and trap gear, you know, like gill nets and crab pots and minnow traps, things like that, uh -huh. um, to, to try to figure out what species are on a lease. And we would compare that to a control site nearby. So, you know, you can sort of see the effect of a lease. So old school ways of collecting data. Right, the old school ways of collecting <laughs> data, which is, you know, which is fun. It's fun sure, to yeah. handle the fish. And important. Yes. Um, but we also used um, a couple of high-tech approaches, and one was using um, a sonar, um, acoustic imaging. So it's, a, it's, you know, it's basically the most expensive, uh, you know, fanciest fish finder you could ever have. Right. And it's, it, it's similar to an ultrasound, you know, um, and it's, it uses really high-frequency sonar, and it images the water so you can actually see the fish swimming. It's not um, just looking down. Right. Well, you can orient it in different ways, oh, I see. but I see. you know we we tended to to orient in a way where you can you can see a, a swath of the bottom um, and the oyster gear, and you can use that technology to count fish and to and to measure fish. Huh. Um, and that was really critical on an oyster lease because you know on an oyster lease it's a really complex you know area. You can't. Pull. Right. You can't use certain types of nets on an oyster lease because there's, you know, there's just it's impossible. A lot of snags. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like it is. A, it's like one big snag. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, the the sonar. It's it was great because it's you know it's non-lethal. We can see fish you know swimming and in, in, in their natural behavior, hmm. and it doesn't have a lot of the biases that uh, nets and traps do. So nets and traps are great for understanding what, what the species composition is, who, what, what, what the different species are there. But they don't, you know, they're not always great at really getting a, a complete picture of how many fish are in a unit area. There's, they're very selective. Right. And so do you, is it about a certain amount of time that you use this sonar? Is it about getting a certain volume that you measure? Um, how do you make that comparison between sites such that you have some sort of normalization to make that comparison? So like when you when you turn the, san the sonar on, you, you have a standard sampling area that it's always sampling. So, and you can position it the same way. So you're always getting the a precise, you know, amount of the water column and the amount of the bottom that is sampled to count fish in. And 
with with the acoustics here, are, is this something that you're actually you're counting while you're in the field, or you all this is recorded? You bring it back, and, right? Yep. Okay, so, so you're basically just bring it back yep. to the lab and. And it funded, in it funded several technicians to sit in front of the computer for <laughs> hours and click and drag over fish. And so what, are you, are you focused on a specific fish or is it just fish around these areas? For, for those, kind of both. You know, we're, um, the, I guess the big picture thing is the abundance of fish. And, and the sonar doesn't, you can't really, you can't identify species in the sonar. Sometimes okay. you can, but... Um, you can get sizes of the fish, but we can estimate numbers and even biomass of the fish, you know, like the, the weight of a fish in, in, a, in a parcel of a uh, space. Huh. Um, yeah. So, but with the, the species composition data, we, are, we were interested in especially the economically important species, sure. um, species that are important to fisheries, just because it's, it's just something of interest. Like, what are the what are the species that are really valuable and how might they be using least bottom versus non-least bottom? Right. Is there any habitat enhancement for important species? So can you give us, you know, a, a quick understanding? Have you, I mean, is there a difference? Have you learned anything when it comes to thinking about these, these yeah. leases? Yeah, so there's like roughly, I mean, we're still conducting and finishing these analyses, so this is all preliminary, but we won't um, hold it to you. <laughs> <laughs> but this, I mean, this story won't, will, will not change much. Um, there's, rough, there's about twice as many fish on, a, on an oyster lease as compared to a similar um, chunk of the estuary where there's no lease. So there's, okay. a, there's a big enhancement of fish. And the chunk of the estuary might be just muddy bottom, muddy sandy bottom? Yeah, we try to like replicate whatever the whatever lease the bottom is on would be. so you can have like okay. a, 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 a real nice comparison. Mm -hmm. And it would be, you know, like several hundred meters away. Um, and uh, there was definitely a, well, I guess it depends on what, how you look at this thing, but the, the species on and off the lease were similar, you know, but just sort of different relative proportions of different species. Um, but we definitely saw um, a lot, at least based on initial analyses, m more um, desirable species on a lease from a fisheries perspective, um, like sheep's head, which maybe we'll talk about in a minute. Um, uh, black sea bass, gag grouper, sort of these structure. A lot of a lot of the important fisheries in North Carolina are these structure-oriented fish. Okay, you know we we saw a little so by spiny adding structure, lobster, by, things like that. Yeah. Right. So by adding structure, you're you're potentially enhancing the fishery. Yep. Exactly. And so, how does that compare to again? Because a lot of the rules in place related to developing this aquaculture is, a, or not. <laughs> Not that I know all the rules, but I know there are rules related to SAV and whether there's mm -hmm. presence or absence of SAV. Yep. Um, and so from a fisheries perspective and whether you have SAV present or, or whether you're working around um, some of this oyster aquaculture, is there, do you see a difference or have you studied that difference between sort of a fisheries-based understanding? Like in terms of... Do you like have a, more fish around this habitat, around the aquaculture compared to what you see in, in SAV? So... Yeah, so we, we actually, so in addition to visiting the commercial farms, we also did an experiment where we made our own sort of 10 meter by 10 meter oyster farms, hmm. which were in SAV. Okay. And in, in high, much higher amounts of SAV than, would, that, than commercial growers would be allowed. Would be allowed. Which we got approved for. <laughs> <laughs> not, was not Disclaimer. It was not necessary. It wasn't easy. Right. Um, Anyways, um, but it's to it, it's, it's to learn more about the process, right? Yep. That, yeah, and that and and like that's a key point that you bring up. So we, so SAV is a really high quality fish habitat. There's high, much higher fish abundances in SAV as compared to muddy bottom. Right. You know the the mud flat, um, but when you we found that when you put oyster gear in a, in sort of a patchy SAV environment, the the number of fish still goes up. So it, it, it so it does enhance. Yeah. And, so. and again, differences in, in the species composition. Like, you know, we see certain species in seagrass, like gag grouper and, you know, little juvenile snappers and things. But they do, they, they preferentially will go to the least to hang Interesting. out. Interesting. Yeah. And so, I mean, and this is really putting you on the spot. And I don't know <laughs> anything about here, but I'll just ask the question, right? So <laughs> SAV is, is thought of as, as this great carbon, you know, repository, right? Being mm -hmm. able to take up CO2 and sort of deposit um, carbon. But oysters are made up of carbon as well, right? And yeah. so they are sequestering CO2. 
Um, they also are creating organic matter. And so I'm, any idea if, from a, a blue carbon perspective, right? Is there, do you know if they're comparable? Yeah, I wouldn't be comfortable to say like wh what, I'm throwing which one you out is, there, which one's storing the more carbon than the other. And I guess it depends on what you do with the shells afterwards. Oh, um, interesting, yeah. Often the shells go, at least in North Carolina and probably most states, they go to the, to the state which uses them to, to plant more oysters. Right. Um, so presumably, you know, I, I don't know if I've ever seen any information on, on tracking the you know, the 10-year lifespan of an right. oyster cell. A lot of the right. shells... That's the next yeah. job. That's the next project, is to see, from a blue carbon perspective, how important these might, might be. There are critters that like to, you know, there's a, there's a parasite called a boring sponge, um, which gets into oyster shells, and I think eventually just kind of crumbles. Crumbles. And, and the carbon pride does ultimately go back into the atmosphere. All right. Well, but it was, a, it was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> but it does have potential. Right, it could be, right? Uh, anyway, I, I think it's something to think about, right? So the idea that it might not just be this difference between that you have to have SAV or oysters, but there, there might mm. be similar benefits to both. Yeah, and oysters have, there's no shortage of ecosystem benefits in right, oysters. Right, that's right. Yeah. Or economic benefits, uh, Yeah. and there's a lot sure. of interest in people eating those. Yes. Um, so you mentioned sheep's head, mm -hmm. right? And so some of your work is studying sheep's head, and I thought yep. maybe give you an opportunity to just talk about some of that work. Um, so we're, we're analyzing sheep's head in a number of different ways. Um, it's the, the state of North Carolina has just kind of been assigned management of the species, and there's really no information on them. So a lot of what we're doing is trying to understand the life history of, of that particular species better. Um, what types of habitats the juveniles use, um, when they're when they're spawning aggregations, and where the spawning aggregations take place on, in in the in uh, on, in the ocean. Um, but we also use them to analyze oyster leases, which was kind of I don't know, sort of a serendipitous use of sheep's head. Um, we were ultimately just interested in how fish. Well, let me back up. So you know, we see much greater abundances of fish on an oyster lease. Right. Um, but are the fish kind of passing through, you know, what's, how long are fish staying there when they're on the lease? Are they getting gobbled up? Things like that. Um, so we use the sheep's head um, as, a, as, a, as a test species or, you know, yeah, a, yeah as the species of interest um, to see how they move around on an oyster lease. Okay. And so we, we tag them with acoustic tags. Um, so there are these little cylinders that emit this, this acoustic Ping. So this would be active acoustics. Right, right. And we, re and we released the oysters on an oyster lease. And um, this was work done by my, my grad student, Andrew McMaines. He did, he did all the work. I showed up for some photo ops. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, well, you know, I'm, I helped out via email. That, stuff. It's uh, good that yeah, the yeah. grad students have yeah, somebody to yeah. help them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he, re he released these fish, these tagged fish, into an oyster lease. Um, this was done in Cedar Island. And um, positioned around the oyster lease was an array of acoustic receivers, so they're basically listening stations, and there are these black cylinders. Um, and he positioned nine of those kind of in a grid pattern that surrounded the oyster lease. And, and those, those receivers are constantly listening for these, these pings, mm -hmm. and the pings tell the receivers exactly which particular fish um, were, that it's receiving. Right. And the coolest thing about this was um, the receivers kind of act in the same way as um, satellites do for your, your GPS. They can triangulate the exact location, location. of a fish. So, you know, the, the, each receiver is picking up an individual ping at slightly different times where, depending on where the fish is located. So they can use that to, right. to get the exact location of the fish. And, and can it pick up multiple fish at the same time? Yes. So oh, wow. at one point... And maybe you'll see an animation of this. Um, there's, uh, at one point, there was a day where I think 18, 16 or 18 different fish were on the oyster lease at the same time. And the coolest thing about this animation is initially you're going to see the fish are sleeping. So sheep's heads sleep. Actually sitting uh, on the bottom, middle of the water column, anywhere? We, we, we're thinking maybe towards the bottom, but you know, they we're dream? not sure. I'm sure they, they count sheep. They fall asleep, <laughs> and then they probably dream about something else. Oh, I like that. That's good. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, at one point we had 16 different fish, and we can track the movements of those fish. And I think in the animation, you're seeing one 24-hour period moving 
at fast forward, you know, we get an individual ping of, of a fish every 60 seconds. Right. And so we can use this to A, see what the bedtime uh, is of a, of a sheep's head, <laughs> and B, to look at, um, you know, do they leave the oyster lease? If they do, do they come back? Um, how do they behave on the oyster lease? You know, some of these fish are literally kind of going up and down the oyster bag rope lines. Um, and just hanging out. Yeah, so they, they definitely seem to really um, stay on the lease for a, a substantial amount of period of time. So I got multiple questions now. So the first is, do a lot of fish sleep? That's a good question. Um, sheep's head are, are kind of known to sleep and, um, because like people that gig for them for flounder, you know, where they put the lights and they uh -huh. look for flounder, occasionally you'll see a sheep's head just kind of sleep in there. Huh. Um, other fish, you know, certainly have periods of, of inactivity. You know, they might be nocturnal or diurnal. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, I don't know that they sleep to the extent that sheep's head do. Like, I don't know, there's, I don't know that there's a lot of information on it, to right. be honest yeah, with I was, you. Yeah, well, I think anyway, of a, if that I'm seems an, like an interesting topic. Yeah. Um, and how people <laughs> discover that they sleep. Um, but I guess more to the point, um, do you have, and so thinking about these tagged sheep's head, um, my guess is your array is just set up so you can get good coverage around that site. And so you know if they leave, you don't necessarily know where they go, but you know if they leave and you know when they come back. Yep, that's right. Um, Andrew also put receivers up kind of in the broader area of the bay. Oh, okay. And he has, he has to dig into, I mean, this is kind of hot off the press data. Oh. Um, but he... he uh, heard it here first. <laughs> yes, this is, <laughs> yeah, this is the first viewing, I suppose, of this. Right. And... Uh, so yeah, you can see the fish leaving the lease, and then presumably, if they when they leave the bay, because it's an enclosed bay, um, we'll we'll pick that exit up with the with what you call like an acoustic gate, right? Where they, they have to pass through it if if they want to get out of there, right? <laughs> and so, do you see that um, these fish do come back? I mean, I guess the first is, do they often leave, and if they do, do they often come back to this same location? Yeah, I don't. I, I probably Hard can't answer that. Yeah, right. Yeah, right now, I know that they. I know he did see fish leave, and then they came back. He also, you know, he also saw some kind of really. Um, sometimes when you look at these things, you sort of see what you want to see. So you get that's, that's why we have <laughs> that's why we have to use statistics. But right. you know, you you watch these videos, and sometimes the, you can see the fish moving, even when they leave the lease, and it looks like they're just making a direct path to like some piling that's a hundred meters away from the leaf lease. That you know they kind of. Sometimes it just seems like they, they know how to navigate the, the, the embayment somehow. Yeah, well, they're probably smarter than yeah, we think. Yeah, I think so. It's, yeah. they, get, they get a lot of rest, I think. Right. <laughs> it's the extra sleep that yeah. helps. <laughs> so what are some of the challenges of doing the work that you do? Um, the oyster culture work, well, I'm, I mean, working um, the, it, using traditional fish gear is definitely a challenge, um, uh -huh. which is why we brought in the sonar. But... Um, you know, when you add the high-tech approaches, they're great, but when you go out in the field, you end up, you know, the boat is just packed with equipment, you know, sampling gear, right. sonar gear, and that, that's definitely a challenge with that sort of thing. Um, yeah, but oh, I mean, overall, working on the oyster farms has, has really been a lot of fun. Yeah. It may be even a little less challenging than some of the other things I've done, huh. you know, working out in the oceans and, and things like that. Okay. But anytime working with the, the technology, you know, there's always this... Um, you know, added step of learning how to use the technology. <laughs> um, things not working. Yeah, things going out <laughs> in the field and forgetting something, the batteries aren't charged. Um, so, yeah, that's a constant. Yeah. That, that is definitely an added layer of complexity. Right. So how do you, how do you think or how, how do you hope that some of this work will be used, you know, within North Carolina or beyond, um, but thinking about... Um, the work that you're doing and and the significance of it, given what North Carolina is trying to do in the way of growing and, and building that the aquaculture. And so how do you see your research sort of feeding into that? I think a few different ways. Um, you know, the, the, the state fisheries agency is constantly trying to understand, or really trying to understand how different types of habitat um, lead, you know, promote productivity of different species and protecting important areas. And as oyster culture expands, the oyster leases are becoming sort of an increasing 
part of this estuarine habitat mosaic. So sort of understanding how an oyster farm might contribute to species X, Y, or Z, it, I think could be significant. Um, it could potentially inform further debates about overlap with seagrass. Mm -hmm. um, as you know, that, that is a contentious uh, situation and we right. definitely want to protect seagrass. Um, they, not too long ago, they did sort of relax the rules a little bit, but they're still pretty low tolerance of seagrass in an oyster farm. So I think maybe our results will at least help inform um, the policymakers in, in making some of those decisions in the futures, or if there's some, some kind of a strategic way to, to do that and to let people grow in areas where there might be more seagrass. Yeah. Um, and finally, I, I think, you know, a lot of aquaculture kind of has a bad rap in some ways, and a lot of people think of like salmon culture and, you know, wild fish escaping and breeding with the native salmon or, you know, lots of nutrient effluent from a salmon farm, those sorts of things. So sometimes aquaculture in general might have a little bit of a negative connotation right. or shrimp yeah, can, farming yeah. things. I think, that, I think that's probably true. Yeah, so here we can show data that, that suggests that oyster culture could really be a win-win and a really good way to produce jobs and to promote local seafood. Um, and I think, I hope that the growers can potentially benefit from that and, in, in, um, you know, getting leases approved and, and passing through the hurdle of, of uh, public support. Right. <laughs> and it seems like it's, it is a growing industry. And so mm -hmm. the opportunity is now to, potentially now to sort of get into it, particularly as we learn more and more efficient, effective ways to actually do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to remind people to put their questions into the YouTube channel if you have any questions. And so I, I wanted to sort of end with the typical question that I ask all of our scientists because I think it's I think what we do and what we want to do is is demonstrate well for one that our scientists are actually human, um, but that they do come from all sorts of interesting backgrounds and and the path that that most of our scientists took wasn't you know from high school to, yes, I'm going to be a doctor working at CSI. But it's usually these interesting paths that we take to, to get here. And so if you were to sort of think about some advice that you would give a youngster or a high schooler or something, um, what might it be? How, you know, thinking about your, your path to get here, what do you think some good sage advice for somebody interested in the field? I mean, I, I could think of a lot of things that I didn't, that I wish I did when I was younger, <laughs> and, and that would probably be my, my best advice, um, or wish, that I wish I did more of, is, you know, just get out there, um, volunteer, um, look for any opportunities to get experience in really anything. You don't have to, you don't really have to know what your endpoint is or, or what aspect of science, you know, any science that you might be interested, um, just to really uh, diversify your experiences and hands-on experiences. You know, there's, uh, you know, once you get into, as an undergraduate, there's internships opportunities and, and you know, just, yeah, just taking advantage of, of what's available and getting out of your sort of familiar bubble. <laughs> yeah, I think that's great advice and it fits, again, right into what we do here. There's opportunities yeah. for high schoolers, undergraduates to get involved in what we're doing, maybe to work with you. I'm going to fill up your lab. Yeah, come on over. Um, and so, I mean, those sort of experiences can help sort of set the stage for what you might do at some point in the yeah. future. And, so and, I, and I would add to that, like, you don't, you really don't need to know what you're, what you really want to do. I guess I've gone through my life sort of taking, taking one thing at a time. I, you know, I feel like I could have ended up doing forestry or something and I probably would have been super happy. Right. You know, I, I just, right. I just like, um, you know. Or as a historian. Yeah, I don't know, well. No? Yeah, maybe not a historian. <laughs> I think history is cool, but all that stuff's already happened. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's fair. All right. I appreciate, this has been really interesting. I've learned a lot um, and I, I appreciate you taking the time to sit with us. We'll take a few questions. Um, and so, again, if you have questions, please let me know. Um, you can sort of send them here. Um, one question um, related to climate. And so we do talk a lot about climate change. We see some changes occurring in our own waters, whether it's sea level rise or potentially warming temperatures. Do you, do you see um, changes for us in the near future or, or you know, how climate might influence 
fisheries in North Carolina or more broadly? Um, definitely. I mean, that's, that's sort of the other big area of my research. Um, the, the southeast hasn't had the huge rates of temperature increase as that the northeast has, um, but the last five years suggest, you know, things are starting to get a lot warmer. But um, fisheries, fisheries management is really, you know, based on this concept of sort of a static population. You know, there's year-to-year -year variability, but there's kind of always this, this average way that different fish populations behave. Um, and what climate change does is it, it, it might enhance the productivity of one species or decrease the productivity of another species. So it kind of throws a wrench into the spokes of, of, of fisheries management in so many different ways. Um, and a lot of times the historical data they might have used to try to understand a, a population of fish isn't, isn't very effective anymore because the, the nature of that fish is changing due to the changing climate. Hmm. Um, yeah, so there's really huge implications um, and it's not necessarily, you know, it's not like all the fish are, are, are going to be declining and, and it's all bad news. Um, you know, there's going to be, some fish are going to respond positively to warmer temperatures. There's, there's plenty of species that, um, that will probably respond better to warmer temperatures. We'll probably see less of certain species and more of other species. But the, um, the big challenge is just this, the, the nature of this change that's happening and we're not we're sort of moving away from these baseline conditions that we've been used to for so right. long. And so where do you see aquaculture going in the future for North Carolina? I mean, it's trending upwards. The, uh, I, I, there are some, there's different rules and where it's being allowed to expand and where it's not allowed to expand. And I, I can't, yeah, yeah I'm, I'm a little foggy in my memory with some of those rules. Um, or what the caps the state might be, oh, okay. might be putting in place. And, I, and I, a lot of those might really affect how it grows. Um, but from my recollection is there's lots of interest in oyster aquaculture. And I think that, that the state is getting lots of applications for leases in different areas. So at least in the near, near, near future, it's, it appears to be growing. And at the federal level, um, the, you know, like the, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration has has set really lofty goals in general for U.S. or aquaculture, huh. like huge. They really want huge increases in aquaculture because you know most of most of the seafood in the U.S. that's eaten is imported. So, yeah. um, okay, good. <laughs> well, more to come. Certainly, a lot more research coming from you, and we look forward to having you back in the hot seat yep. to tell us more about what you're learning. <laughs> We appreciate you joining us tonight. Again, in about a month's time, we'll have another Meet the Scientist. And so stay tuned and thanks for joining us. We'll see you later.